All right, so if you were here for the first part, we, we heard a little bit about things like how the EHT actually makes pictures of black holes, real-time um, real data processing using Julia for radio astronomers, and also how you can use Julia to find aliens. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about a little bit more work on EHT that I've been doing, but how we can use Julia to image black holes on our laptop. So what is the uh, Event Horizon Telescope? Well, so I guess I should mention, I am a member of the Event Horizon Telescope. I, uh, I've been a member of it since 2017. I helped image the black hole M87, the one at the center of, um, the, one of the center of the galaxy M87 and Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So how, what is the EHT? The EHT is a very long baseline interferometer. And what this means is that we use a global network of telescopes. We cross correlate the signal, we cross correlate the signals between pairs of telescopes. And by doing this, you can make a telescope the size of the entire earth. So by doing this, we're able to achieve angular resolutions that are completely unprecedented. So for instance, the EHT resolution is 20 micro arc seconds while JWST is roughly 10 to the five micro arc seconds. This is because, again, a dish the size of the Earth. And the problem though is, is that because what we measure is cross correlation between telescopes, we actually measure the Fourier transform of the image. And what this means is that we have to figure out how to turn sparse Fourier coverage or measurements at these blue dots into an actual image on the sky. So how do we actually turn this into an image? Maybe the simplest thing you would think of is just doing an inverse Fourier transform. Let's, for instance, assume the, the Fourier components or the Fourier amplitudes are zero everywhere except where we have data, and you get something that looks like this. If you add some more coverage, you get this, you keep going, you really start to fill in the globe, you name every one of these blue points as a telescope, and you go, and you start to see something, and then you start to see something, and then you fill everything in dense, and you get a crisp crisp image. Unfortunately, I can't put a telescope every square meter on the planet. People would get mad at me. So instead, we have to figure out how we can image our coverage, which looks like this. It's this very sparse sampling. There's wide vasts of the, of the Fourier space that are completely empty, and the measurements themselves are incredibly noisy. And so how can we image this? We do it with modeling or forward modeling, or if you're a Bayesian, Bayesian inverse modeling. And so to do this, you have to understand really our computational pipeline. So computational pipeline, I mean, what it would be like if I was actually going to simulate things. So I'm going to just imagine I'm making my own universe and how would I computationally simulate the generation of these images. So you start with some on-sky image model. You measure the Fourier components. For this, we use a non-uniform Fourier transform because we only do these sparse measurements. You, 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 want to, you can't just use a regular discrete Fourier transform. That scales horribly. So you use an NFFT. It does an FFT under the hood and then does really smart interpolation that's beyond the scope of this talk. Once you get that, you get your Fourier components. And if we had a perfect interferometer and I took out the atmosphere and choked us all, this is something it would look like or something close. Unfortunately, I can't do that. People will get mad. So instead we have to model the actual impact of the telescope itself. These are things like gains. So what a radio, what a radio dish does is basically just measure voltages. I have to, how it measure these voltages, maybe there's uh, weirdness in the electronics path, there's some drift, or maybe the atmosphere is completely scrambling things. This kind of models this. And under the hood, you can model this through some sp sparse matrix multiplication. Once you get that, you get your actual simulated observation. This is kind of what the data we get actually looks like. And once you get that, you can go from this to your observation. Then forward modeling approach, you then feed back on your image model to find, try to figure out what actually matches the observed data. In the EHT, there was two approaches to this. Something called regularized maximum likelihood. You take your data terms, you add some regularization to make it smooth or sparse or some combination thereof. Or you can view it as a Bayesian inverse problem where you try to solve everything together all at once and get a distribution of images that match the data. So the original tools that we used in the original publications required about a week of high performance computing to get these results. 
The Bayesian methods, a, a C++ code that I helped to develop, uh, Themis took a week to construct this posterior. I'll get into the reasons why it took so long. And RML methods, or these regularized maximum likelihood methods, had to, if you go back to this, uh, this uh, regularized maximum likelihood term, there are these lambda terms. You have to say, how smooth do you want this image to be? Do I want it to be really smooth, like, like just like some Gaussian, or do I want it to be extremely noisy? And you have to basically guess and check over and over and over again till you get to something that meets some heuristics that you specify. It's not very automated. And because of this, you have to produce a ton of images and it takes a week on a cluster. So part of the reason this took so long is the tool. So again, EHT imaging, which is one of these regularized maximum likelihood codes is a Python code. Themis is C++ Bayesian. The, they kind of were developed for different things. EH imaging was developed for interactive desktop use. There were these imaging workshops in uh, 2016 and earlier where we all got together, got locked in a room and iteratively fiddled with imaging until we got stuff that we could trust. Themis on the other hand was focused on distributed computing, MPI and HPC systems. It doesn't have a Python front end as a user of it. I was regularly writing MPI scripts, make files, linking. It took a long time. I was very bad at it. It was not a great time. But they can do slightly different things. EHT imaging can't solve for the gains in the image self-consistently, or it can't solve for the sky and the image. It does them iteratively in some scheme. Themis does them both at the same time in a Bayesian scheme. But they both lack something interesting. They both completely lack autodiff. EHT imaging hand-rolled gradients so I'm sure a lot of people here have handwritten gradients. They're annoying. It's way harder to write a gradient than it is a function. And so this took a massive amount of development time. And it doesn't really work with complicated models like this. So if, for instance, we wanted to do something really complicated, like solve a fluid simulation as our image on the sky, we couldn't do this because you wouldn't be able to propagate the gradients through. Uh, Themis, on the other hand, did auto diff in the sense that it did finite difference. So we just did finite diff on everything with all the wonderful gradient errors and everything that could happen and the poor scaling and the solution to the poor scaling was use more cores. So we MPI'd everything. So this was a problem. And so one of the things I wanted to figure out was how can we improve this? So to figure out how we can improve this, we need to ask what the EHT actually requires for imaging. So it needs a few different things. There's flexibility. We have a very wide class of models we have to consider. There are really simple things like geometric models, rings, disks, or whatever. Now, they're simple to describe on the sky in the 4A domain. This results in Bessel functions, hypergeometric, all these kind of funky things that you learn in your analysis class. Uh, we also have ray tracing models. These are where we take an actual uh, set of emission around a black hole, and then we ray trace back to our eyes to see what it actually looks like. This is different than your video game ray tracing, because in video game ray tracing, you show throw straight rays, they bounce off things and collect them in your eye. We don't have to worry about that, but instead we have to worry about the fact that light bends as it comes to your eye. So you have to integrate through, you have to integrate through these rays bending and integrate through this matter, solving these things called radiative transfer equations, hard, whatever. We also want non-parametric modeling or imaging. This is hard itself, or maybe you want a piece of everything. We also typically want interactivity. At least I want interactivity. This is a very complicated modeling problem. It's very nice to tweak things figure out what's going on and apply it over and over again. So a typical workflow is you pick a model, you assess the data fit, it looks crappy, and then you repeat over and over and over again. We also need performance. Imaging and calibration have thousands of parameters for the EHD data. Bayesian inference requires like a thousand to a million plus likelihood evaluations easily. And we typically will want some sort of distributed or accelerated hardware GPU support. We also need rich differentiation support. One of the most surprising things was when we first started this was complex number support in a lot of libraries is not great. And so ADing through complex numbers kind of gets tricky. I didn't realize this, but it turned out it was kind of hard. We also want sparse matrix support. I don't want dense matrices, these massive dense matrices floating around. We have a mixture of scalar and vector code. These ray tracing models are heavy control flow, so jacks. Static graph will be really struggle with this because 
the function you trace depends and the, the, it will be some while loop that will terminate really depending on where you are and what the black hole parameters are. This makes something like that very difficult. And we also want easy to add custom rules. I don't want to spend 10 days or a week trying to figure out some super hard C++ code. Uh, so for me, this sounded like a two language problem. People in Julia land always tell me this is what Julia is supposed to solve. So I thought I'd give Julia a shot. So I developed a package called Comrade. It stands for Composable Modeling of Radio Emission. It is a mouthful. I aim to make the worst acronym known to man. I'm not there yet, but I'll get there. It is a Bayesian black hole imaging and modeling code. It really tried to stress test the exploration of uh, the Julia's auto diff functionalities. And it is already being used in the EHT. It was used for the Sagittarius A star images, uh, specifically the modeling stuff. So it has been applied already and it will be in future publications. Um, it also tries to be very generic. We have a whole bunch of different models. All those models I talked about earlier, we are imp we've implemented. We also, I tried to be put on my computation or CS hat a little bit. I'm an astronomer and mathematician by trade, so that's hard, but I, I tried to get scaling to at least what it should be. So N log N for the Fourier transform, sparse matrices instead of dense matrices whenever I could do it. I try to use memory, reuse memory buffers as much as I can, zygote and all that prevents that. Um, and I also use a mixed AD system. So we use zygote and chain rules as the backbone. I use forward diff sometimes for broadcasting and enzyme when all else fails and the code is amenable to enzyme. So now all this, is it fast? So comrade one core uh, beats, uh, beats Themis uh, C++ code by a factor of two, just on the likelihood or the forward pass. It beats EHD imaging the Python code by 14 times. If we move to gradients uh, for these small models with forward diff, I get, a eight, I get an 18 times speed up over Python and a 17 times speed up over Themis on one core. If you cheat and use 16 cores, you can get it back down, you know, but maybe if I fit a thousand parameters, that's not so great. So in terms of actual like benchmarking as a, as a function of number of pixels, you can see the difference in some of these scalings. Um, then, uh, EHG imaging just has massive overhead. Python, I, I can't get rid of, I can't fix that. Themis, which uses a discrete Fourier transform scales is N squared times M, where M is the number of data points. So it scales horribly. Um, and we scale as N log N. Uh, at the same time, when we look at the, four, or the reverse pass, their EHC imaging does, does fine um, because it's using handwritten rules. So, you know, you can hand tune those things to whatever level you need, while Themis uses finite diff and it scales horribly yet again. And so what does this mean for actual imaging and real data? It means that, well, in 2017, we took a week. For us, we take an hour on a single CPU. So this was a massive change for the EHT. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> This was a, a massive change for the EHT and it's, it's very important for us. It also lets us do things like make polarized images in three hours, which is also took about two weeks before, so, or more than that. So yay, win. Uh, also, if you wanna to try to make some of these yourself, you can check the docs. Uh, I try to run through some of these. If people find issues with the docs, please let me know and I will try to fix them. <laughs> Um, the big thing though, and the reason I really dove into this is that this will enable the next generation EHT, at least for our current tools. In 2017, we had this really bad coverage. We are in the middle of a funding proposal round where we want to expand the EHT and NGHT to this. This is a factor of 30 data on a single day. And instead of observing five times a year, we're going to observe a hundred times a year. And so what this means is that if we had stuck with the old tools that took weeks to run on a cluster, we would have quickly gotten into a point where we were taking too much data for us to handle. Now, thanks to Julia and Comrade, we can do this and we can make big, beautiful images, potentially like this one here that shows the same black hole, but with this better coverage where you can actually resolve this jet, this big, powerful jet that flies out of the black hole at near the speed of light, flinging plasma and powering blazars and quasars and these brightest things in the sky. This also means that we can start to do really fun things like put a satellite in space, 
who wants to, instead of making this fuzzy image that we had before, add an orbiter up at geo and turn that really blurry image into something that looks like this. And so we can finally have crisp images. This is a bit of a pet peeve of mine because when we released the first images of uh, M87, the first question I remember the press asking is, why is it so blurry? Did you try to enhance it? <laughs> And so, uh, dang it, we're going to enhance it. We just need to go to space. <laughs> so why was this possible with Julia? Multiple dispatch, generics, package really helped. Not having to statically link stuff or dynamically link stuff in C++ helped myself a lot. All of this allowed me to really dig into optimization more so than I was able to do in C++. Julia is not faster than C++. I will never claim that. All it lets me do as a poor astronomer is more easily figure out where to optimize and not have to dig through thousands of lines of C or C++ code. All right, thanks. And so summary, Julia provides an excellent environment for analysis. We typically see a 10X performance boost um, and Julia is becoming a major part. We are developing uh, the next backbone, at least partially in Julia. Myself and Kazu Akiyama at MIT Haystack are, are gonna be trying to lead this forward. All right, thank you. Is that true? That wasn't for me? Oh, okay. Well, I think, actually, I'm like only a few minutes over my 15 minutes allotment. Okay. Any questions? I have time for two minutes, and then I'm going to move on to the next talks. Yeah. So uh, is it the case that you are mostly uh, bound by the computation of assets? Yeah. I am, at this point, um, with our data volume, entirely NFFT bound. So if we want to optimize this, it means me finding some time and porting it to the GPU, or if someone can beat an FFT, I, I don't think, but that is, that is we are we are NFFT limited. This was actually the goal, because I wanted, there's other things that should scale below the NFFT, and I just wanted to make sure the code was at the point that we are FFT limited. So is there like crazy taxation, all that stuff you're talking about, that's more like a- The, the NFFT dominant, yeah, like the, the NFFT and then the pullback of the NFFT, because you have to evaluate it twice is, is the majority of, of the time. I can't, I can't get around that. Yeah. Making movies is hard. Um, there is a team, Nifty, that tries to do this. I think we are gonna try to do it. The problem with the array right now is that if I, if I showed this coverage, and this is the coverage over an entire night, the coverage you get at a single snapshot is like one of these points in each track. So it becomes super sparse. So you need to have a very good dynamics model and nobody understands how these black holes evolve. It's a massive open question. You can't do it with fluids. We don't know what the correlation structure looks like at all. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know if it's a power spectrum with three, two, whatever. It's, I don't even know if it's stationary. And in fact, it is not. There are flaring events that happen every once in a while at random intervals, but, but we're working on it. I don't wanna promise it yet, but we're working on it. This is part of the NGHT 